Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Live. I'm your host, Tony Duty, and I'm pleased to be joining you from my professional home at University of Delaware. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live Network and you can tune in to Student Affairs Live Wednesdays at one o'clock Eastern time. In a moment, I'll introduce you to our guests, but we can't do that without first giving a shout out to the sponsors that make Student Affairs Live possible. Higher Ed Live, I, Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a digital first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. This broadcast is sponsored by ACPA, College Student Educators International. ACPA is excited to be hosting the 2019 Presidential Symposium, co-sponsored by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education at the University of Maryland. The event will take place January 25th and focus on the 70th anniversary of the student personnel point of view through a racial and social justice lens. Speakers include ACPA President Jamie Washington, Executive Director of the University of Maryland Center for Diversity and Inclusion, Rather Worthington, former Board of Directors member for the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, Art Dean, 2018 ASH President, Lori Patton Davis, NASPA President, Penny Rue, and founding editor for Encore, Chris Salinas. Join ACPA in person at the University of Maryland or watch the entire event online via live stream. Graduate degree programs and student affairs divisions are encouraged to gather students and our colleagues to watch and live stream together and engage around the presented topics. ACPA will provide discussion questions and other resources to make this experience the ultimate professional development event for you and your team. Register today at myacpa.org. I want to take a moment to thank Carrie Locke, who is helping to monitor the back channel and forwarding to me your best content and questions from the Twitterverse. And now it is my privilege and honor to uh, introduce our two guests for today, Ed Cabellan and Heather Shea. And, and I'd like you each to start off by sharing what you're up to these days, how many episodes you've hosted, and for how many years. And if you're looking at the screen, you probably see this pulsating um, or this, this uh, very handsome photo of Ed Cabellan. Uh, and I'm going to let him explain um, the photo and and uh, where he's where he's at right now, Ed. Hi everybody, Ed Cabellan. I am uh, calling. I'm in a car, so Ed in the car might be a trending thing today. But I am in a car because I am in a new job, and the new job requires me to be mobile and on the move all the time. So uh, I am the vice president for student services and enrollment management at Bristol Community College in Massachusetts. Uh, I started here six months ago after being at Bridgewater State, which many of you know I spent much, uh, much time there, 12 and a half years. Um, and so I moved here, I went location-wise. I'm working here now and really enjoying the role and um, you know, loving being a vice president and learning to be a good vice president. And uh, that could be a whole other conversation for another time, but I remember Higher Ed Live and Student Affairs Live fondly. I, I, did the, I did the role as host starting in 2012 after a conversation in 2011 uh, with Seth, Seth O'Dell, uh, who's the godfather of this whole thing in my mind. And I had about um, probably two dozen uh, shows over the course of those two years formally. And then I think since then I've been on, I've guest hosted, a number of them. Most of the episodes are on either the HigherEdLive.com um, higher website or on YouTube under Higher Ed Live, and so uh, it's been such a treat and such a, such a such a wonderful joy to be back with you, Tony and Heather, to talk and reminisce about um, the show and all of all of the wonderful um, educational opportunities it's afforded us and other people. Fantastic. Now, Heather, I, I remarked when I saw you your email earlier today that you've got the the most exhaustive list on your signature line. I, I can't imagine someone <laughs> having more titles in their signature line. So, what are you up to these days? And and talk about your experience. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks again. I'm thrilled to be here and uh, grateful to, for the opportunity to return to Student Affairs Live. Um, I am still at Michigan State University where I'm finishing my PhD in the Higher Adult Lifelong Education or HALE program. I'm a candidate. I'm hoping to be done in the spring and graduating in May. Um, my aim is to um, hopefully find a way to balance all the things that I'm up to in addition to uh, working on my PhD and finishing writing my dissertation, 
which is why I ended up moving into a graduate assistant role. Uh, so I actually have two different graduate assistantships. Uh, I'm working on a project through the Hub for Innovation and Learning and Technology. Uh, we're launching, as of January, a campus-wide co-curricular record, um, which we're calling My Spartan Story. And it's a way for us to document student learning that occurs in co-curricular spaces or outside of academic courses. Um, I also am serving in a graduate assistantship with the Office of New Student Orientation, I'm serving on a steering committee that is uh, leading, I guess, a reform efforts to bring our new student orientation program um, into the modern era. And I am uh, in my free time, and this is more for fun, um, a faculty member leading an education abroad program in Europe. And so from May, I don't know, almost immediately after graduation through the 1st of June, I'll be with a group of teacher education majors um, gallivanting across uh, the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany and France. And uh, so those are the those are the primary things. In addition to being a doc student um, here at MIT, regarding your other questions about hosting, so I started uh, when Ed left, I think, essentially, um, right at the beginning of the year in 2014. So I guess it's been almost five years. Um, and over the course of that, uh, you know, nearly I don't know. Uh, four and a half years or so, I hosted over 65 episodes, many of them with the two of you, uh, some of them live on stage. And uh, yeah, so it looks like about one once a month. So that's no small list of, of things that, that, that you've done. Um, I, I think the other hashtag word might be gallivanting. I want to use that word a few times throughout <laughs> the episode. So, so for both of you, take me back to that moment when you decided to become a host. How did the opportunity arise and what was your motivation for doing it? Heather, Heather start with you. Sure. Well, as I said, I kind of took off when, or when Ed referred uh, folks in Stone to me and I had a phone conversation with Mallory. This is actually right when I was in transition between leaving the University of Idaho and moving to Michigan State where I was going to start the PhD program here. And I think at the time I was anticipating kind of moving away from student affairs. So I think part of the decision was um, maintaining a connection with my professional field and home. Um, and I think that was kind of the, the main reason. So it was an opportunity that kind of came out of the blue. My, why I decided to do it, I, you know, I've always been kind of, fearful of public speaking. And so this was a huge really? uh, risk. Yeah. I did, not, I, I did not know that. Yeah. So I, I think I was trying to take on a challenge of something that um, I didn't know that I could do. And, and I don't know that I did it particularly well. I definitely got better uh, over time, but I really enjoyed the, the challenge. So that's why, that's why I took it. So thanks to Ed. All right, Ed, you're up. Uh, yeah. I, when I think back, it, it's been a while. I mean, it, that's six, seven years ago now, almost. And uh, I think it was, there's an episode out there on YouTube with Seth O'Dell and I in California. It was in June of 2011 because I was out there with my students for Campus Movie Fest. And I remember going to visit Seth. And if you ever see this episode, I think he will, he will, will confirm this. I went out to his place because we, we had just met. And this is the power of Twitter. So when you think about when this took place, mm -hmm of how Twitter was so uh, influential, I will argue, during that point in student affairs, in higher ed, and just the, the budding of technology and how we were beginning to apply technology differently. Seth was already doing these online live shows, just him talking, you know, it's like a talk show. And I did one with him on the future of education, I think it was. We were sitting on his couch in his living room broadcasting live. And I just thought, that what a cool idea. And then I remember Eric Stoller being also a host at that point and him moving on because he was getting busy with his speaking and all these other things he was, he was doing at the time. And Seth was like, you know, is this something that you'd be interested in? And, you know, I, I'm always up for new opportunity. And whenever we can have a chance to do anything innovative, I always want to try and get into it. And so I remember him saying, 
it's not a lot. You just turn on Google, you do this and that. And, you know, I think because I had some idea of how to use technology, I was, I was that for me, that wasn't the, the challenges. It was really for me, would people watch and would add value to whatever education or conversation folks were having at the time. And the Twitter, the student affairs Twitter community then, I would argue is much different than it is now. Um, and, you know, not good, bad, or indifferent, just different. Um, and so I think the, the followership that we were able to build during that phase of student affairs and higher ed live with M. Stoner and, and all the other folks involved at the time, they were so supportive. And I just thought, you know, why wouldn't I do this? And um, I was nervous much like Heather. Um, and I was nervous really professionally because I didn't know if things went wrong, could that negatively impact me? Would I have to worry about all that? And, uh, I had such support at Bridgewater at the time that I wasn't worried about my employer supporting me doing it because it helped put Bridgewater on the map in many ways. But looking back now, it was Seth O'Dell, and him and I will always have that, yep, he asked me to do something. I'm going to say he's one of my yes people. Yep, I'll say yes to you. Just ask whatever you need. So uh, I think that's why when I reflect back why I did it. Cool. Now, you, you said you were both confident and nervous. What, what was your reaction, Heather? <laughs> I, I think I am nervous before every episode. Um, I do the practicing in front of the mirror thing, uh, make sure what I'm writing, because often I script out, as, as we do, and we kind of talk about how the show gets made, script out the front matter. Um, but if I have to say something in particular, I'll practice, make sure what I'm writing sounds as good. Um, my first episode, though, I... I remember being nervous, but I remember like really not knowing what to expect or how it was all going to go. You remember, um, remember what it was? Um, so it was, so I had just started my like full-time position at MSU before I transitioned to grad school work. I worked full-time here and I was interested in kind of the new year. It was a new year. And I think this, the episode is called something like beginning your new year, new role in the new year or something like that. Um, and so the idea was, these are all people who have recently transitioned and navigated that process of transitioning um, either to a new camp, new role on their campus or to, as I did, across the country or from a full-time position back to graduate school. And I think it really reflected where I was um, at the time and trying to kind of figure out how you make sense of kind of a professional identity shift. Um, those topics that have most aligned with kind of my own pathway have been the ones that have been the most um, easy and fun because I can feel like I can be a part of the conversation. Um, but yeah, that's that's why I remember that was the topic that I tackled first. Uh, uh, for either of you, were there any guests in particular that made you nervous? I, I think for me, the one I remember this because uh, I was thinking I, ne I had never met her, but I always wanted to. So I used the show to try and get to know her with Ellen Heffernan from Spelman and Johnson. Oh, yeah. So, you know, so she was someone I knew was larger than life some of the folks that really, really admired and respected. And she was someone I knew at the time I'd want to get to know anyway because of my career, what I wanted for my career trajectory. And so I remember feeling like, man, I, I've heard all about you, but I've never met you. Now I'm the first time I'm really going to meet you is on the show. <laughs> and so um, that was one guest I remember feeling, man, I, 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 she was as advertised for sure. Um, but I, I do remember feeling like that with her. Yeah, I had her on for an episode, too, and I remember thinking, you don't want to mess this one up. <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, Heather? Oh, uh, I have so many uh, <laughs> folks. I mean, I did, I did an episode with the two um, authors and then the two executive directors of ACPA and NASPA, um, about a book about gun safety on campus and that topic on it on its own was nerve-wracking but then the folks who were on that panel um, So one person who I've I brought back multiple times who I always felt like I wanted to have a preparatory conversation with um, in advance of the episode that he was going to be on was DL Stewart and so whenever Deal was on, uh, you know, in advance, and I feel like at one point Deal uh, emailed me and he said, I, I want to talk to you about what your purpose is for this episode.
Nice. So I, I think people think that this all happens magically and is a, is a piece of cake to, to work through uh, on our end. So I'm hoping that you can talk about the kind of preparation and research that goes into each episode. How does the proverbial sausage get made? Well, I'll start because I think it's different now for you, you folks after you took over, you know, in terms of transition into the, uh, the new format that is now. Um, but I remember the, it, it, it's like most of the complex projects we have at our campuses, there's a lot of planning and a lot of research, a lot of negotiation you have to go through to get the caliber of folks you're trying to get together. Scheduling is always going to be a challenge because you're hoping that the timing for Wednesdays or Tuesdays or Thursdays will work out. And then the research you want to do into the topic, I, I will say now, you you and Heather have done, Tony, you and Heather have done much more, have taken that level of the show to a different level than I did or even maybe Eric or Seth did back in the day because we were still navigating. We were still trying to figure out what's going to stick, what are people going to really be into. You've added a level of research that is unparalleled now for any kind of show of this kind. Um, but there is a lot because you want to make sure that you're, the questions you ask the, the, the guests, and, you know, and we know this, but the folks at home, we, we, we know we get to see the questions ahead of time so that we can be prepared and can have a chance to think about what we want to answer and how we want to answer. Um, but, you know, I think with the amount of content that's out there today, it, it's imperative that the host make sure that that research is done. So it takes time. And, um, you know, not only are you worrying about the preparation, the the show notes, uh, the the front and back pieces that we have to you have to do in order to make sure that you have support. So Carrie helping today and others who have d served in that role before are so critical because they help you manage the show. So there are layers, but I think the playbook that is created now that you all have figured out has been great. And I think every ho every guest and every co-host that have had to be fill in, for example, I, I know have commented how how much better organized you both have done. All Heather. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> no, it's not all me. Um, I, I do think that I have approached almost every episode as like a little mini research paper, research project, lit review, um, because, you know, as the host, A, a I want to craft questions that are interesting for the panelists to, to you know, speak about, you know, at, a, at that level. Um, but I also feel like for folks who are watching, there, this is for a lot of people who are place bound or who are using this as a part of a course, like this is professional development. So um, I, I remember the preparation um, thinking on some episodes, oh, I'm just really not as prepared as I'd like to be. Um, for any time there was a book that was associated with an episode, um, unless it was the How College Affects Students book. I did not read that cover to cover. Um, <laughs> for those of you who know that book, it's monstrous. Uh, but every other book, right? You're reading it, you're trying to kind of do a little bit of additional background uh, research. And often we, we published uh, parallel reader guides that associated with the topic. So. Because they, they they really are stand they're standalone episodes, but they're at the beginning of a conversation for for folks. So um, I hoped uh, you know I hope they had a life beyond. I think is what my aim was as well. So they're timely. Many of the topics were timely at that moment, but I wanted them to be resources and usable um, into the into the near if not far future in student affairs preparation courses and and, and other other locations on campus so yeah the background the writing of the questions the preparing with the technology with folks making sure everybody else felt comfortable that they weren't nervous because it is it's nerve wrack it can be nerve wracking for sure yeah i don't think people understand that we're also the folks that are actually creating the episode a lot blogs, right? The the marketing right. materials, you know, you let thank God we all have our Photoshop skills to be able to pull this off. Um, and then I think the degree of peer networking and crowdsourcing when it came to developing questions or even topics and, and guests choices uh, was really important. I think we were able to reach out to, to folks 
and there would often be ten different eyes on the development of questions, uh, and they would often ch you know change, and someone would would introduce a, a good new question. So I want to talk for a second about the pressures, stressor, stressors of an episode, and and it's so funny that we have this question. That I want you to share a story, a time when when things might have gone awry, you know, either technically or cancellation or challenging guests and and as I look at that question I realized about three minutes ago I actually hid you from the broadcast by mistake Heather um, <laughs> <laughs> like I was writing something on a back channel window on the other side and I was still in our session and it wound up hitting a keystroke to knock you out of the, out of the <laughs> session so sorry about that that's okay all right. That's okay. Oh, I mean, I think that kind of thing happened, right? I mean, I remember um, one of the episodes I had with uh, Donna Lee, she couldn't connect. And so she like had to send a student employee to her home to get her iPad or something. something. I was on that episode too. I remember that. <laughs> it was like people are running across camera. Is she going to join? Is she not? And yeah, um, that kind of thing happened more more frequently than I would have liked. As somebody who is an intense planner, there's all the unknowns that you have no idea what, what could go wrong. I think um, it was mostly connection issues. Uh, at one point, I think um, Keith Humphrey blocked me from <laughs> from something. So like I like literally couldn't invite him. Of course he um, did. I know, I know. Keith Humphrey's listening. It was a, it was a funny because we're like, why, why can't you join? I can't accept your, you know. So anyway, those those were the biggest challenges. I think I definitely had some last minute, unfortunate last minute cancellations. Which anytime you have a cancellation, it completely changes the conversation, the composition of the panel, um, which we work really carefully and closely to make sure we're getting the voices as many voices as we possibly can, given the limitations of Google Hangouts onto the episode. So that was that was always one of the things that was, was struggling for sure. Yeah, you were an over, always an overachiever in that regard, Heather. I remember you having like eight or nine people on an episode. I'm like, how does she do that? Um, <laughs> but you, you pulled it off. <laughs> All right, Ed. So, so I'm listening to Heather thinking, yeah, it's, it's mostly for me the stressors were around the technology. And at the time, I had so many guests who were using Wi-Fi instead of, um, you know, using a landline or, you know, plug into the wall kind of thing. Because we knew the broadcasting capabilities of choppiness and losing audio or video at any time were higher when they used um, Wi-Fi. And if they didn't have headphones in, the feedback, like there's all these things you worry about because you've seen it. And at the time, you either do you just close the broadcast and restart and hope hopefully people will come back or, you know, so, there's, so it is a technology because of the, because of the medium. Um, I think for me, one of the most stressful shows back in the day was one where we did student affairs live from one of the, um, one of the SA tech unconferences I used to do back again, this is again, I'm dating myself back in 2012, I think where we were traveling to all different locations. And in Boston, I had a guest outside of higher ed. It was one of my first guests outside the academy, Sarah Evans, who still is a digital correspondent and still does a lot of work with digital media. Um, but her content and when she talked about it was very, it, it didn't go, it went over like a lead balloon because we were broadcasting live from SA Tech Unconference and the, and the folks who were watching would, would have, the feedback I after, we would rather have you just live stream the unconference conversations then listen to Sarah because she was great, but it didn't have any relations. And so my intention is to get someone from outside the academy to try and broaden our perspective. Didn't work that time. So I had to be mindful about, well, who do I bring in? So, you know, that's when I started thinking about guests like Sarah Lipka, who was, I think, at the Chronicle at the time. That was connected, you know. So um, it just was one of those stressors that I didn't expect and when I encountered it. And as, as she was talking, I remember going, oh, you mean so well, but this is not right, actually working right now. <laughs> and so you do your best by leading and trying to get them to a place, but when they don't have that academy mindset, it's hard to get them into that. So that's one story I remember. Yeah. You know, broadcasting live from locations is one of the things that I think Tony and I, uh, we, we took what we learned one year where it did not work so well and turned it into a completely different experience the next year. Um, cause I remember I had an empty ballroom 
with Jillian Kinsey and George Koo. And we're doing this episode and I'm like, if anybody's watching this online, they're probably like, why are they sitting in an empty ballroom? And then I'm also like, I'm in an empty ballroom. Like this could be a live audience kind of thing. And so I think that resulted in innovative um, ideas that we ended up doing with contested issues, right, Tony? Absolutely. Yeah, that was right before the ideas generator panel that we had Ed actually come in and do back channel for us. Ah, that's right. That's right. And that one had decent um, attendance. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was that's because they, they heard Ed was doing back channel. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so here's here's a fill in the blank question. Fill in the blank. I know I had a good episode when Heather. The the back channel was active. I mean, I think that sometimes it was super quiet and it was still a really good episode. But if it was creating a back channel buzz, it was it was always interesting. Um, to read, go back and read those comments after. Um, so, and, and I'm sure it's crickets right now, hopefully. There's no one watching today. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Not well, we're having fun. Good. Ed? Um, I think for me, it's when I got emails after or calls after about how impactful the episode mm -hmm. was. Um, nothing public, but more things that I'd get direct message or I'd get some text saying, you know, that was great, or that made me think, or did you think about this, or, or that's how I know people really got something out of it, because some people can't listen the whole time, because they don't, maybe they may not have a whole hour, or they're, they'll listen to it in a podcast after, or whatever, and so that's why I know it was impactful, when I get those sort of messages after the fact. So, uh, this was a, a question that I hesitated to, to write for you both, but, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. You know, when hosting, the, the world's always watching, and, and it is stressful. The episodes are recorded, and they're shared in perpetuity on YouTube and, and on the High Red Live archives. And while I recognize that scrutiny, judgment, and criticism come with the territory of you know, being an online personality, I think that lots of colleagues in our field take pride in, in this aspect of public shaming and con condemnation of others. Uh, I, I don't think that we offer each other a whole lot of grace in that regard. Can you share a time when you felt that kind of weight? I'll go. Um, I don't. I don't think in the time that I hosted the show that I felt publicly shamed. Uh, I'll. I'll share. I won't name names, but I will share times where I was challenged um, at conferences, actually, about the choices I made in not doing more controversial topics. So if you look at my episodes, my episodes are pretty safe. They're not, not they're, they're rarely anything that really went to um, a place where folks could really dig, dig in. And, but I never felt at the time, again, I, I'm different now than I was six, seven years ago. And so maybe now I would be in a better place to do that. But I, by the time I wasn't. And so I would have to have those conversations they, I don't think they ever came to fruition online. They may have, and I may have just missed it because I wasn't on that channel that maybe I was being criticized on. But I knew, and Seth and I talked about this. He said that to me. Just be, just know what you're doing because you are, you will become this. You, you may not think of yourself that way, but people will think of you that way. And so you have to take care with um, how you say things and why you say things, and if you have you know, that research to Heather's point earlier, that like mini paper, if you will, to have good data, to have good research to support why you're asking the types of questions or you have the types of guests you have on. And so, you know, I, I've been criticized by it, but not public. I don't think I've been, I mean, I may have been, I'm just really not aware, <laughs> which is a completely possible, uh, but not nothing public that I, I can remember during the time I was a host. So... Sorry, I can't give you a better example, Tony. <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate that. And and I would say that I similarly have taken a, quite a, a safe route and say all the time, um, I, I'll say this, I've said it to you before, Heather, I, I admire your courage in, in taking on some really Agreed. controversial topics that you know are setting yourself up potentially for for feedback and, and criticism. And, and folks should know we often get asked by associations to do different topics and they're almost always on 
on the edge. So, uh, you know, I'm like, that's all you, Heather. And she's been really great and gracious about accepting what I think are some pretty challenging topics. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, with the power of being the host, you have responsibility, right? To, and I took that, I took that really seriously as I know I am here, I'm a white woman, I'm sitting in this space and I have power to, to curate the conversations that I'm interested in. And yes, there are conversations that need to be, that need to be had. Um, those were the, those were the shows that, you know, caused me, I think the most anxiety and angst as well. I mean, because, you know, to, to be vulnerable, to admit that I might say the wrong thing in this show, um, it's, it's, it's hard, that's hard to, that's hard to do sometimes. Um, the, the one episode where I feel like I was called out on, uh, I actually didn't necessarily know it at the, t at the time. Um, it was only later, like maybe a, two months or so later when I discovered a blog post that was written about me um, as a result of something that had happened on, on an episode in which um, the, the episode just hadn't unfolded the way, the way I would have liked. And I take responsibility for that. And I love the accountability. I, I welcome the feedback. I received many, as, as Ed was mentioning, you know, private conversations. I had folks Facebook message me, you know, you said this, this didn't sit right with me. I totally, I totally got that. But to, to months later discover a blog post that was written, that was, that was super painful by somebody who I considered a friend. Um, I think there is kind of a gotcha culture, you know, a little bit, you know, if I were waiting for people to screw up, um, we did an episode actually um, in which White white people, in in particular, uh, on the episode that was that was also a challenging episode. Um, I lost you. Uh oh, see, we lost her. See, technical. Look, of course it happens. See? On our <laughs> of episode. course it happens. Oh wait, here she comes. She's coming back. <laughs> see, this is the stuff, Tori. <laughs> <laughs> We'll give her a second to, to come back on that. Um, I'll, I'll go to you while we wait for her to rejoin the episode um, in no case problem. Michigan State lost their entire um, interweb presence. I hope so, so. So, Ed, why did you decide it was time to hang, hang up your hosting hat? And, and by the way, I appreciate that you're, you were the one that actually put my name in uh, for consideration, though I didn't think I was ready at the time. Um, but it was because you were stepping down that, that an opening came up. So why did you decide it was, it was time to move on? Um, I think in a lot of ways, Tony, and we've talked about this, when, when you do things in the digital space, there will be moments where you, you do it because you're exploring, you're trying to find community, you're just trying to, you know, there's something you're trying to achieve as part of this exploration online. And for me, I, I knew that I was going to be starting a doc program, and I, I think I started a doc program in 2013. And I just remember feeling like I couldn't do it all, that I had to start stepping back from some things. And I had gotten such great experiences and feedback from – whoops, Heather Shea's gone. Um, she, hopefully she comes back. Um, I had gotten so much out of the opportunity that I knew it was time to pass it along and give others the opportunity, and you were just such a clear – choice for me in terms of pushing names forward as, as someone who I had gotten to know through Twitter and other digital platforms and the work we did together. And so, um, you know, so I think that's why I, I knew it was time because, and same thing with like my blog, same thing with the things I used to do. You know, I got to a point where the, 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 co the benefit and the cost benefit, if you will, in terms of time invested and what I, the reason I was doing it for changed. And so, that's why I left. It was more, I think it was time for me to go. And I was trying to also just role model for others that, you know, you don't have to stay in one thing for a long, just because you love it and you know how to do it. You may be preventing others from getting opportunity. And so I just saw the opportunity to recommend you and others. And, um, and I think the interwebs and higher ed live is much better for it because you said yes. 
Well, thank you. All right, Heather, glad to have you back. You want to pick up where you left off? I am now on my personal hotspot because... Did someone run you know, to get your iPad down at your house? No. I, I don't know, but it's probably going to take my entire data allowance for the month. It's, I'm, I'm just kidding. It's fine. I'll send you, I'll send you a check. <laughs> Higher ed line will send you a check. Yeah. Um, I don't even know where what I was saying when I left off. I, it was fine on my end. It looked like it was fine at least. So I'm You were probably talking for a whole minute before you realized. I probably was. I probably was. All right. So, so we can move on to... to yeah. Why did you decide it was time to hang up your hosting hat? Yeah. I mean, I had a huge personal and professional transition that happened in my life. Um, and kind of what I overheard Ed saying, too, I think that it's we're better as a profession when people who are in leadership roles know when to step out and give those opportunities to other folks and widen, widen that um, that plane a little bit. I think for me also, I uh, needed to really focus on my dissertation and um, and I love doing higher ed live. So I would I would you let that distract me night and day. You know, I've also removed Facebook and Instagram and Twitter from my phone. Like I've done all the things to try to um, remain as focused as possible. And the time when I'm not doing dissertation or my like three different jobs. Um, I just couldn't justify time away from my kids too. So yeah, I think those were the reasons. Um, and then I just, yeah, there's some personal transition stuff in my life that needed to kind of take precedent. So. Well, we're sorry to see you go. Uh, yeah. I know it's not the last of you for sure that we'll, we'll hear from you. <laughs> so I, it would, wouldn't be a fun episode. I don't think if we didn't get into a speed round. Um, so I'm going to ask you for some short, either one word or, or short sentence answers to, to about 12 questions here. All right. So we'll just go back and forth. Uh, start with you. We'll go Ed, Heather, Ed, Heather. All right. Ed, favorite episode. Favorite episode, uh, the future of digital education when we published the book with Josie Bath with, and it had uh, myself and uh, Josie and all our authors on one episode to talk about the book. That was my favorite. Awesome. Heather? I loved the marriage equality episode uh, that I did. It was right after the Supreme Court decision, and it was like an, an all-star episode of really cool people. So Love it, it was right. awesome. Ed, favorite guest? This is hard. I loved all of my guests equally. So um, I think reflecting back, Larry Roper, like he was one of my first guests, like back in the day. And he was, again, someone who I admired and I adored. And I'm like, how do I meet him? I know. I'll throw him on a show. So I will just say Larry Roper. I love it. I, I have the picture in my head with the, with the like 1970s headphones that he had on. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All my right, favorite, Heather. my favorite guest um, was on, I think, three or four times. Kathy O'Bear um, always challenged me to think in new ways. In fact, I think Kathy was on that episode that I just mentioned. Um, but her two books and the and the episode based on those books were, yeah, totally rocked my world. And I think it, the prep calls, I think, were what um, were part of what made her a phenomenal guest. Felt like a coaching session. So. Nice. All right, Ed. Controversial topic. Most controversial topic. Oh, Tony, I don't know. We, I didn't really do controversy. <laughs> uh, I Wait, don't know. You I, were on the debate. <laughs> you were part of the higher ed Oh, debate. yeah. Oh, okay. So most con what was last this past year with TJ Logan when he got me on stage. So what, I forget the. I even forget the topic now. I, I remember is that I will. I first of all, to be clear, this isn't speed round etiquette. I'm sorry, but <laughs> but I didn't know we could do slides during those debates. If I had known, I would have absolutely. You know me. I would have brought it. But that's okay. I still love TJ Logan, and I, I didn't even say what the topic was, so I'm sorry. I'm totally – I'm in a car. I'm sorry. I'm not – That's really... all right. You were such <laughs> right. a good sport about that. I, I apologize again. I'm sure I'll have payback for that someday in right. my career. I was going to say, I think you were in on that, Tony. You were aware that – He was absolutely was, Heather. He was absolutely <laughs> in on me. I can't see his face right now, but I'm sure he's laughing at me, so it's fine. That was the best. Um, controversial topic uh... – I don't know. There were a lot of them. I mean, I think um, probably the episode that spawned the most controversial follow-up episode, which ended up getting um, 
a, a great conversation going was right after the Orlando shooting, the LGBTQ plus Latinx um, conversation uh, was fantastic, but that was probably controversial, I guess. Not the topic, but how it came about. Gotcha. All right, Ed, favorite word? Possibilities. Nice. Heather? Woo. Woo? <laughs> All right. Least favorite word, Ed? Moist. <laughs> <laughs> what? I thought, that is so funny. You are the second person who I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that word, so I'm going to use it today. <laughs> I'm going to say bleak. Bleak. Bleak? Bleak. Okay, good. Oh, bleak. That's a good one. All right, Ed, favorite dessert? Carrot cake. Heather? Tiramisu. Nice. Um, all right, Ed, what flavor of ice cream would best describe you? Uh, currently, Rocky Road. <laughs> oh. Heather? Coffee almond fudge. Nice. Very Ooh, nuanced, like layered, caffeinated. <laughs> all right, paper book or ebook, Ed? Uh, paper book. Ebook. Ebook, really? Oh, we got flipped. All right. Favorite Ed, favorite recent book. Do you have time to read books now that you're a VP? Not really, but my favorite over the summer I read a book called The End of Average, which is great. And oh my I god. It for a very good one. Yes. The End of Average. I forget the author's name, but great book. Great audio book too. Oh my god, I was just having this conversation with a colleague. Um we're gonna have to I have to check out that book. Get that author on a high red live episode, right? Yes, sir. The, the end of average. Excellent. I'll put that on my list. I am currently reading Becoming by Michelle Obama. Phenomenal. Oh, another good one. To read. I yeah, can't. Yeah. I I can't not be reading something, and it's phenomenal. I also pretty much love everything by uh, Meg Wolitzer, including her most recent, The Female Persuasion. So, yeah, fiction, nonfiction. All right, All right. Uh, Ed. Favorite series or TV show? Uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, I thought you were going to say Walking Dead. You switched. Nope. Game of Thrones. Yeah. All right. Heather. Handmaid's Tale. Oh, wow. It's disturbing. You, you totally. got me watching. It's really disturbing. All right. Uh, Ed, last speed quote, speed round question. What higher education scholar and or practitioner inspires you the most? Uh, currently, it's Kevin Kruger. He's oh. just doing some amazing work in policy and helping shape the future of the profession, and I and admire him greatly, particularly now from work, the job I'm sitting in. So I've gotten to see what he's doing, and it's, it's great. Excellent. Heather? I'm going to say Donna Lee. Oh. Love Donna Lee. So, yeah. For lots That's, of reasons. I love it. I, I love Donna Lee, too. All right. So I want to shift for, for a second. We've, we've only got about uh, 16 minutes left here and, and talk about the state of student affairs and higher education. And I want to first focus on any challenges or concerns that you have uh, about where we are. Ed, do you want, want to give it a shot? Sure. So um, sitting in the vice president's role now, I have a new appreciation for the, the role and, and the responsibility that come leading a division of student affairs. I also oversee student enrollment. So having enrollment management and student affairs in my portfolio at a community college um, has really given me some newfound perspective. And so challenging, challenges and concerns for me continue to be um, enrollment challenges in the, here in the Northeast. So in, uh, enrollment decline is real and it's affecting a lot of our smaller colleges especially in Massachusetts. And so we've had a number of closings, um, Mount Ida uh, being, you know, one um, that has touched a lot of the folks that I know really well. Um, and so I'm really concerned about the role that student affairs folks are going to be asked to play growingly uh, as it relates to enrollment uh, management, because the shift of how do we think about our work in, in, in enrollment management uh, re retention strategy wise all without losing the student development and um, the pieces that are core to who we are as a profession so um, because with the decreasing enrollment also comes decreasing staff because the the math just doesn't, doesn't add up and so how do I um, you know how do we as a profession continue to evolve in ways that we've always talked about Tony using technology thinking about ways to change our pedagogy helping our faculty to to connect with our students in different ways. Um, 
So though, the enrollment stuff uh, for sure, and then our, the mental health of our students. It's, it's, it is an epidemic and something that, uh, you know, it's really challenging right now. Very good. All right, Heather. Well, so um, one of the big conversations that we're having here at Michigan State University, because we're a part of the University Innovation Alliance, kind of pulls on some of the things that Ed just mentioned, um, which has to do with retention. And my advisor, uh, mentor, uh, I ASH president, Chris Wren, is on this campus, and she talks a lot about how student success is the kind of link between the enrollment piece and what's happening in student affairs and student development, because we're all a part of the conversation around student success and how do we um, decrease time to degree and close achievement gaps. I, mean, I think those are all bigger conversations that um, most campuses are having, but particularly these institutions in the UIA. Um, and if you're not familiar with the UIA, you should definitely look it up. They're doing some really interesting and innovative things in, in, in retention and in Michigan institutions there. Um, and it, I mean, I think the other part that's linked to that is how, and this relates to my work on campus right now is how do we define what learning is and where learning happens, um, how students grow and develop during their time on campus, and then how do we know that what they're doing here matters? And so I think we've been talking about assessment for a long time, but um, the ways that student affairs and higher education discuss that needs to be much more tangible, I think, to external publics in order to make um, it real why higher education costs what it does today. Um, so those are those are some of the things that I'd say are interesting, challenging challenges and concerns. Um, in addition to what what Ed said for sure around mental health and technology too. Okay, so now now let's flip it around. What, let's talk about what excites you. Like what what are you really looking forward to in the next decade in our profession? And I'm hoping you'll you'll both make some what I hope will be some bold predictions. Uh, that when we look back on this episode, you know, 30 years from now at your retirement roast, um, people will say, yeah, you nailed it, or you got to be kidding me. <laughs> uh, 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 you start, Ed. <laughs> uh, I was like, uh, you go, me go? Okay, I'll go. So um, I think what's most exciting for me is um, the, the role of, of what community colleges can play. And, and it sounds really self-serving because I'm in a community college now. But I have to tell you, I think there's some really great opportunities for partnerships that may already exist or that might have to evolve because of how um, community colleges can become pipelines for students to the four-year degree that's, um, you know, just different than what we would normally, well, we would think, I've worked, I've always worked in four-year institutions, public and private. And so I think we need to reimagine for particularly low-income students and those who speak a different language and might be coming from, gate, who might live in gateway cities. And what I mean by gateway cities are cities that have a lot of folks from immigrant populations, folks that have families who have never gone to college, so those first-generation folks, that community college might be the pathway to the four-year degree, that whether it's a one-year program or a two-year program that gets them into the traditional, quote-unquote, four-year programs, I think what's exciting is the role that community colleges can play. And I think moving forward, in 10 years, both of my daughters will be in college. And I would not be surprised if the way they do college in, in six to eight years, really, um, is quite different because of the, the number of colleges, unfortunately, that are going to close due to financial stress. Uh, it's a real thing. And so for us not to talk about it would be ignoring it. So let's just call it what it is. And so the options, particularly here in the Northeast where I am, um, we have to identify and move forward on these partnerships that are mutually beneficial because we're all going after the same students. So how can we identify more clearly what those programs, academic programs and support services are to fully support those students to success? Well, six, six to 10 years, you think there'll be that much change in what uh, has historically been a pretty slow moving profession, not profession, yeah. institution. Yeah. Right? I think Tony was, I'm sorry to keep going, but as more small colleges close, I think the alarm bells will continue to go off. I don't think people have taken it as seriously until they start noticing 
the number. Forbes just did an article. I tweeted it yesterday or the day before, looking at the data around the forecast over the next ten years of how many small colleges under, I think it's uh, I think it's FTE fifteen hundred. I, I might be quoting that wrong. I'm sorry if I am. But small colleges who are on the brink of because of the Moody's index and all the financial stuff that are connected to colleges, there will be a significant number, unfortunately, of those types of colleges closing. And I just, I just think the academy can no longer ignore what students really need from us that are different than what we're offering. All right, Heather, you're up. Yeah, my head's spinning. I, I am trying to think about what how this relates to what I'm going to say, which is completely different, but that's okay. Um, I think one of the things that I have observed as I've traveled to other countries is a very different model in the way that we um, see what is higher education and what is the public good and how we're funding. So, I mean, I think one of the things that excites me most is that I think that um, if we can boldly make the case that um, higher education is for the benefit of our larger citizenry. We make a, a, a better case, I think, in engaging students across all different backgrounds and, and perspectives. So um, access and inclusion, I think, are some of the things that we'll see more of. Um, but I think when I think about the profession of student affairs, you know, the affairs of students are dispersed on campus. And so I would maybe be so bold to say that I don't know that student affairs, the profession of student affairs looks the same um, going forward. And part of this has to do with on my own campus, the way that we have it within our academic colleges, uh, student affairs functions, um, doing that direct service with students that um, aren't within the division of student affairs. So uh, when I think about what excites me about the field is that I think that it's it's obviously, it's expanding and growing. There's a huge need for um, collaboration, for professional development, for mentorship, and for um, folks to connect and share great ideas and be innovative. So um, maybe those are some of the things that we'll see um, even more so in our in our coming so maybe that means that our professional associations look differently, what it means to get a degree to practice in this field um, looks different. I don't know. Those are all potential things that could happen in the next 10 years. Tony, can I add something else that I just saw as Heather was speaking? Yeah. So um, I also think what's exciting in 10 years is that the, uh, the um, change in leadership at the, t you know, at, at mm. senior level, think of how many folks maybe retiring over the next 10 years and how many folks, you know, from, you know, generation X, gen Y, who will be stepping into those roles and what that might do for the, for the changes that are needed. And so I think about leadership changes. There's so many new presidents in our region now that are not, that are of a different mindset. And I think with every new leader that comes, that steps into the academy at, a, at whatever level, I, I think there's opportunities to move it a little bit faster than what we've been used to. Hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting thought, and as right, th there's going to be a there's going to be a gap between with with Gen Xers as we try and fill some of those leadership positions. Um, and my concern is always that we're filling some of those positions with people who have not come up through the ranks, who have not been extensive practitioners, who perhaps have have missed a few steps as they've gotten to the role that they're on. Certainly not the two of you, that's for sure. Um, but that would be my concern moving forward. So in... Agreed. Agree? <laughs> agreed, agreed, yeah. Uh -huh. So two, two more questions left, and I know you got to get running, Ed. So in one minute or less, what advice would you give to a young professional, or more specifically, the younger Ed Cabellon or Heather Shea? You first, Heather. Oh, Heather. Oh, I'll go first. I so I am going to be forty-five. I wish I would have gotten my PhD ten years ago. Um, so that would have been one piece of advice. Uh, and then you know, I think I think I've le I've learned a lot through different other challenges, personal situations that have happened in my life that I think have reframed my focus a little bit. Um, maybe 
be a little bit less idealistic at times. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think those are some of the advice. As far as advice for other folks besides myself, um, which I really benefited from is to get involved and connect um, nationally and internationally with colleagues. Uh, you know, what's happening on your own campus isn't the entire world of student affairs or isn't the entire world of higher education. Um, and I have benefited so much through the professional connections and, and um, networks and, you know, specifically with the two of you, but um, broadly through ACPA and, and through NASPA. So I would really encourage folks to find those networks and, and if anything, keep you connected to the current pulse and trends and, and uh, topics that are going on. Good advice. That was yeah. less than a minute, right? Ed? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so I would say first and foremost, if I was talking to my younger self, I would have looked for more opportunities to get budget and HR experience in the roles I was playing earlier on in my career. Uh, I got it later in my career, which is helpful, but I think it would have helped me understand the big picture as opposed to the smaller picture in my roles as I first started in, in student affairs. So I think having more command of budget and HR piece is important, especially in a unionized environment, certainly something for folks to learn. Um, the second thing I would say is that um, don't go back, if you're going to go back for an advanced degree, whether it's a PhD, EDD, doc, you know, doctorate of any kind, I, I always tell folks, until your next job needs it, don't go back. Because I think a lot of folks are now rushing to get the PhD or the EDD younger without the experience, and I don't believe there's really a value add there until you have some experience with the doctorate. There are some folks who will argue with me that the PhD is what you need, and that's fine. But I think if you're going to be in administration and campus leadership, I would wait until you know the next job needs it, and then go back. Uh, you'll find the experience that you gain through work and through volunteer and through life will, will make that experience more meaningful as part of the program. Good advice. Oh, that's good. All right, last question. Uh, we'll start with you, Ed. So as you look back at, on your Student Affairs Live legacy, what is it you most miss and what is it you're most proud of? Um, I think today just makes me reminisce and miss this. I mean, the opportunity to take time out every week or every other week to have a conversation, uh, whether it was just by myself, what, two people watching, or whether it was with more people, um, I think researching a topic and sharing ideas and asking good questions you know, I don't, I don't make that kind of time now because of the role I play, but I certainly miss it. And I think the legacy I hope to have left, um, you know, just in terms of Student Affairs Live is that I, I hope it did provide a good ground for folks like you and Heather and others that will follow us to continue reaching out and doing these things with courage to reflect what Heather, I think how Heather has, has done things and you too, Tony. Um, I just hope that we have, uh, made the made the table longer for people to to sit at, if you will. Heather. Yeah, I um, yeah, I miss I miss the conversations for sure. I miss digging into topics that I don't know really that much about until like a great idea struck. Um, and I I really miss and and I think one of the ways that. I, I found the fulfillment was I had the opportunity to um, apprentice teach with Chris Wren in her student development theory class. And we built episodes of Student Affairs Live into the curriculum. And um, that kind of brought it full circle a little bit because it was a way to, to see kind of how what we were doing had real life applicability in a, in a curriculum for a course. Um, and I miss that interaction with master students, I think, that came from those conversations. And so, um, yeah, I think those are the things that I, that I miss. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll be back at some point. <laughs> I think you're both going to be back at some point. Well, we are at the end of our time. I want to thank you both for doing this, particularly so close uh, to, to the holiday season. I, I miss you both. Um, I... I think you know what an impact you've made on my life and, and my career, and I'm glad, I'm, I'm better off for having you both in my life. Um, I look forward to seeing you hopefully at an upcoming conference, both of you, so we can get the squad back together and, and 
create some mischief as we always do. Yeah. I've, I'll be back next month with an episode on what I hope will be uh, the end of average with the author <laughs> that Ed has suggested. <laughs> Um, and if not that, I'll be focusing on attrition in student affairs, which is the more likely topic. You can receive reminders about this and other great shows by subscribing to the High Red Live newsletter. You can also browse the archives at highredlive.com or subscribe to the iTunes podcast. I'm Tony Duty. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you make it a great week, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. <laughs>